Well, good morning, Fort Creek Baptist Church. Is anybody else other than me happy that when they woke up this morning, it was in the 40s? Yes. I love this weather. Staying with us as we begin to worship. to worship and rejoice uh, and just to be the family that God has called us to be. Aren't you glad to be part of the family at Fort Creek Baptist Church? 
It is a joy for us to be together. Chris mentioned how cool it was this morning. Uh, a couple days ago, I was on top of Pikes Peak, and it's about 10 degrees there with a nice 50-mile-an-hour wind blowing. I actually thought I was going to have a medical emergency. It was very strange not being able to breathe, but I got off of there quick. Um, I do have a, a long list of announcements to share with you. and You can see these in your bulletin, but I want to uh, bring attention to them. You know we have a group going to see Shonda Pierce next Sunday night, um, but this is a little bit of a change. We will have evening worship. That night, Jim will be preaching uh, that evening. Uh, and then the 29th, you can see in your bulletin as well, the senior adults are planning a trip. So I want to um, just kind of emphasize that and let you be reminded of it. And then uh, that's Friday night, the 31st. That's Sunday. Halloween's on Sunday, and we will have trunk or treat that night. On uh, Sunday night, we're doing a chili supper at 5, trunk or treat at 6. Anything else I need to say? We need you to come and bring your trunk and bring your decorations and, and your candy to distribute and so forth. And so that'll be a great day. We'll have a really good time, I know, celebrating uh, just being the church that God's called us to be still. I want to bring to your attention uh, Psalm 39 this morning. Listen to God's word. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good, but my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me while I meditated. The fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end, the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life here. You have made my days a handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath. I think the idea is just the reminder um, that this is not our place, and we see stuff around us, and we sometimes get too attached to this world, or too um, overwhelmed with grief by what we see in this world. This is not our place. We need God to remind us of that sometimes, and to point us to heaven and to our future in his presence. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the joy of the Lord, for the power of your presence we know that uh, what we experience here from you is, is a foretaste. It's just a, a small introduction of what our lives will be like when we are in your presence for eternity. We look forward to that. We rejoice in it. We know that uh, you're conditioning us now, growing us now, to enter into your presence. But Lord, we pray too that now we would be inclined to bring as many people with us as possible. We would be driven to speak the name of Jesus and proclaim the love and the grace of our God. This world needs to know that truth. And God, we pray in our service today that you would show us your presence, speak your word and your power uh, to your people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we continue to worship. Yours is a name, a name that saved me. 
mercy and grace, the power that forgave me in your love is all I've ever needed. With my wake up in the land of glory, with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. Tell my story, there will be one 
us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special time of worship. Lord, it is indeed worship. Uh, we pray that uh, every heart will be moved, Lord, to give out of that movement, Lord, to, to uh, us realize where our blessings come from. Lord, we pray your blessings on it and what uh, is received here today, Lord, to give back what is truly yours already. Lord, we ask your blessings on the body of Christ here and beyond. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. come and share with us brother he's going to tell you about uh, one of the most impressive ministries I know of the focus is on the word of God and the money all goes to the needs of people and he's going to share with us we will take a love offering at the end at the door uh, for you to be able to support this ministry come ahead I was ready to end it all those were the words of Darlene who lived in Ohio. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She had verbal abuse all of her life, and therefore she had nightmares. She was contemplating suicide by the time she was big enough, uh, old enough to go to college. One day she was walking across this campus, and one of the Gideons offered her a little New Testament like the ones that we hand out. She took him up on his offer because she liked to read a lot. But unusually, she had never read from the Word of God. And so she began, took it home with her, and once she got started, it was like nonstop. She just couldn't put it down. She just kept reading each night and praying. Finally, uh, one day the scriptures got hold of her, and she realized that she needed to be saved. She was had one question for God as she was reading. She, she said, God... If you can take, really are God, can you take these nightmares away? And she slept peacefully for the first time in many years. And she went on to be saved. You'd be happy to know she's married and living in her local town with a Bible-believing church. And 
things have turned out much better for her. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let me tell you just a little bit about who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Uh, all of the Gideons are born-again Christians. We're business and professional men. We're members of the local churches. What we do is we are organized in over 200 uh, countries. This little New Testament is just distributed in 95 different languages. That really goes a long way. And the reason we do it, I believe, it comes straight from the Word of God. Uh, in Isaiah 55, where he says, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. I will, it will not return to me void, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Let me read you a testimony from Francisco Gomez. He started using drugs when he was only 10 years old. He tried to kill his family several different times, wound up in jail, and, and the long, long story short, he got a sentence of 73 years. A group of Gideons one day came in and did a presentation there at the prison that he was in. He just, when he noticed what the Gideons were doing, he just became irate and just uh, were pushing and shoving them and cussing them. Finally, the guards got him back into his cell and got him settled down. He was so mad, he pulled his jacket off and just threw it against the wall. And when he did, one of these little New Testaments fell out. Apparently, one of the Gideons had stuck it in the pocket during this little scuffle he had. But he began to read it. He picked it up and realized what it was, and he began to read it. And uh, within just a few hours, uh, he, he realized he needed to become a Christian. And uh, he was drawn to it and picked it up repented of his sins and was saved and God set him free uh, he shared the gospel with his mother when she came to visit and uh, she pleaded with the judge and his sentence was uh, much lower and now he's preaching over in Spain this next one is good is not good enough lots of folks think that just living a good, clean, moral life is good enough to get you into heaven. Jeffrey was one of those people, and he felt that way. Uh, he worked as a bus boy there at the Dominican Republic, and one day he was helping a Gideon to bring his luggage in into the motel room. And the Gideon shared with him the Gospels uh, and how much stronger God's uh, ideas are than ours, and that we're separated from God and we deserve eternal punishment. We have no way of paying for our sins. If, however, God sent his son to pay that uh, cost in, in our place. He learned that he needed to confess Jesus and he did that very thing and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was saved that very night. This next one is called It Is Finished. It is one of my favorites. The next uh, tells of a dad who's burdened because his son has never given his life to Christ. And he called his son on the telephone to wish him uh, congratulations on his 10th wedding anniversary. And while he had him on the phone, uh, he encouraged him to... Uh, give his heart to Jesus but he had a little bit of an attitude there and uh, he had I guess one thing that made it kind of worse is uh, his son had just told him one day early in the week that uh, he was through with Christianity you know that was it but his dad tried to encourage him but yet, yet not be too pushy and so uh, his dad said, there is one thing I'd like for you to do. Once you make that decision, the boy was worried about signing something, and his dad uh, 
told him, you know, that's not important. The important thing is asking Jesus into your life. And, and he said, but I would like for you to do one thing. Once you do that, uh, just send me a text that says done. And so uh, the time rocked on that rest of that day. And by supper time, his mother was praying along with her spouse for their son. Still no reply. But he decided he'd check it one more time before he went to bed. And uh, when he picked up his phone and looked, there it was, done. Got one more testimony for you. This young woman found herself in dire circumstances. And as a single parent of a three-year-old, she was pregnant with a second child. And both children had different dads. Both of them were in prison. Uh, it was almost just like there was no way out. And she had de recently developed a, a relationship with another member of the gang. She considered abortion, but her boyfriend uh, told her and promised her that he would take care of that child just like it was her ver his very own. Uh, if, and just a short time later, that guy uh, was killed, and it was believed that some of the hit men from inside had it done uh, from inside the prison walls. But as the young woman came to trying to find a way out. Uh, one of the last places they go is to the church, right? And so she met up with a girl named Tammy who uh, mentored her, and uh, she could do it without uh, being judgmental, and that was a big help. Uh, as she talked with Tammy, she kind of surprised her, and she pulled one of these little New Testaments out of her pocketbook, and someone had begun to write the 23rd Psalm in it at the very first, but they didn't finish it out, and so she was puzzled at what this meant, and so Tammy was able to pull that scripture up and read it in its entirety, and she went on to uh, ask Jesus into her heart. She's now living... Uh, a much better life. She freed herself from all of the promiscuity and uh, other problems that she had, and things are uh, really turned around for her. And I would ask that you pray for this mother and her children as they start a new life. I'd also like to thank the pastor for allowing us to come. Uh, you might uh, be surprised, but there are a few churches left that that don't welcome the Gideon. So it's always nice when you do. We thank you. Your brother? I didn't know that. That's Margie's brother. Good deal. We're going to get some secrets from him, Margie. <laughs> I have nothing but support and uh, joy in the work of the Gideons. Uh, I do know um, not only are we taking the um, offering, and you are encouraged to give that way, but um, they have the, the means, the cards that you can honor or memorialize somebody by gifting Bibles, and then the Gideons will distribute those. I, you know, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. If you had a pastor that you, that you cared about or thought about, that'd be a great thing to do. Um, if you know a pastor maybe whose birthday is coming up in, in the next week or two, and uh, you know, you wanted to honor your pastor in, in regards to that, um, he would be very impressed by you giving Bibles to the Gideons. Um, hint, hint, um, nudge, nudge. Um, we're going to begin a new series today. I don't know if um, your previous pastors have done much preaching about money and stewardship, but I generally know uh, what the typical attitude is about preaching about money and stewardship. Uh, yet at the same time, it becomes uh, intensely important, uh, and the world has so perverted 
the way we're supposed to think about money and possessions and uh, God's provision and hard work and all of those kinds of things. The world's just so messed it up that churches really need to talk about it. So just for a few weeks, I'm going to be talking about stewardship. Um, that means if you don't show up next Sunday, we know something about you, right? You know, I'm not keeping a list or anything like that, but this, this is so significant and so important. Um, so my series is Money Is, and the simple title this morning is Money Is in the Bible. Money is in the Bible. It has been determined in the Bible that there are at least 2,000 350 unique references to money. So when I say that money is in the Bible, that is a huge understatement. It is an incredibly important biblical topic. In fact, check this out. Jesus said more about money than anything else. Jesus said more about money than anything else. He taught about it repeatedly, and he also used money and possessions and material wealth as illustrations of so many spiritual concepts. So there's a lot to learn, um, but it's even more than that. Richard Halverson said this, Jesus Christ said more about money than any other single thing because money is of first importance when it comes to a person's real nature. Money is an exact index to your true character. We can look at the checkbook or the credit card statement and see a picture of a person's heart very clearly and very plainly. So we have to think about how we handle it. We have to think about what it means. It is a perfect mirror to the soul. I want to begin talking about the subject just in the most basic possible way. That's why we're starting here this morning. I would guess that there are some people here, just like in most churches, who feel that pastors and churches shouldn't talk about money. I know that's true because all the surveys say that that's what people think and feel and believe. There are also people in most congregations who are confused about money. They don't know um, how it relates to the spiritual implications of their lives. They don't know how to um, use it wisely. They don't know what it's really for. They don't know how to balance it in their life in the proper way. There's lots of confusion. So I'm starting very basic to try and answer some of the confusion and give some direction, even um, some encouragement. Uh, I'm trying to manage my money and live my life, and the absolute best place you can go to figure out how to do that is God's Word. The absolute best place. So we need to kind of put all of the, the, the limitations and all of the confusion and all of the hesitations to the side and simply say, okay, God, if this is your arena in my life, then I want to do it the way you have told me to do it. Now, I want to begin just by thinking about some of the things people say in regards to sermons and churches talking about money, reasons why people don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear it. What do people say? Well, some say, I don't want to hear this because they don't realize how much God really said about it. Well, again, over 2,350 times. My Bible is a large print Bible, and still it has less than half that many pages, which means that it is on every page about two times in your Bible, over and over and over again. You also hear people who don't think that money is a issue, as if this subject belongs to the world, and the world gets to manage it, and the world gets to control it. It's just secular stuff. And of course, when we look at the way people in the world and governments and institutions deal with money and think about money, we see how adept and wise and equipped and well-established they are to handle money, right? The world's got its act together when it comes to money, right? No, no. There's so much confusion and so many problems. We can see clearly why the world has so many money problems just by looking at the financial condition of the world. We don't need the world to tell us how to manage money. The world doesn't know how to manage money. You also hear people that don't want to hear this because... Um, they aren't using theirs the right way, and so they don't want you to tell them anything about it. They can't uh, tolerate hearing about it. This is a typical human response. It's kind of a defense mechanism. When, when the way I deal with my money is a mess, you're going to put your hands over your ears and say, leave me alone, be quiet. I don't even want to hear 
this. And some people will say, I don't want to hear it because um, you, you know this line. They think all the church cares about is money. That's actually a prominent attitude in the world. And uh, unfortunately, there are abuses of the scriptural teachings and abuses of the principles of money and confusions that are propagated by the church. In the middle centuries, the Roman Catholic Church was selling indulgences. You could pay money for the forgiveness of your sins. You could buy off sins. So I can live the way the world says and do what the world is doing and enjoy these horrible things. And then if I just give some money to the church, I'm absolved of that. That problem has gone away. You can even buy your way out of purgatory. And you could buy the way of friends out out of purgatory. You could pay off grandma's sins and get her out of purgatory. Incidentally, purgatory is not real. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. The Pope made that up, and we don't follow the teachings of the Pope. We follow the teachings of Jesus. So understand even some of the abuses of money principles come from confusions about what the Bible says and what the Bible does not say. The indulgence money in the, in the middle centuries was used to finance the Crusades, which was another extreme abuse of any biblical truth and biblical principles and used for some massive building funds. Um, St. Peter's, St. Peter's Basilica, if you ever go and watch the um, Christmas Mass, uh, that's that same building built by the money from indulgences 500 years ago. Um, one collector of indulgence money, he'd travel around to churches and he would give them the spiel for why they needed to uh, give uh, indulgence money and, and pay up for the needs. And he even had a great uh, slogan that any first year marketing student would be proud of. He said this, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And your health and wealth gospel preacher would be delighted in that kind of statement. Uh, we've seen abuses, of course, in, in recent times, too. We can turn on the television and see your big-haired TV evangelist wave around his diamond-encrusted hand. And you see abuses over the issues of money and what the Bible says. Joel Osteen lives in a house valued at over $10 million dollars. Now, I, I believe you ought to honor your pastor, you know, and, and the scriptures say that very clearly. Um, but that might be just a little bit to the extreme, right? Better ways to use that money in the kingdom. So it's very difficult when the pastor stands up and says, we're going to talk about money. And everybody's got all the preconceptions and all the ideas and everybody kind of groans. Oh, here we go. Well, we have to talk about it because it is such an issue of need in our lives. And because the Lord himself teaches so clearly and directly about the principles. Here's just one more reason why someone might say, I don't want to hear this. It's because they think it's a personal matter and none of my business. Uh, well, in some degree, it is true that it is none of my business. Except as your pastor, I have an obligation before God to lead you into the truth to equip you to live the Christian life. So this subject may be none of a, a pastor's business in a personal way, unless you ask questions, you know, seeking God's wisdom, but the subject is entirely God's business. It is God's business. It is deeply important to your eternal success or failure. It is rife for massive confusion and therefore overwhelmingly important for us to talk about and understand. And we need to exactly get that point this morning. I just want to today do a brief sampling. Um, there are enough biblical principles and biblical statements about money. We can preach on it a long, long, long time. I'm going to give you eight principles today, eight issues, and, and it's just kind of a collection of things, um, not really all fitting together, uh, a broad sampling. Uh, if I did broad samplings, I would have 2,350 um, principles and points and teachings that I could bring to your attention, and we could do that a long, long time, right? So the, the desire is to whet your appetite 
to give you some clarity and some, uh, some openness to what the Bible would say about money and to be able to uh, even look at your own life and say, I'm dealing with this financial issue or this financial question or this financial desire. The first place I should go is God's Word. Now let's see what the Lord has to say about the issue. We will be um, talking about some related subjects in stewardship just a, a couple more weeks after this one as well and be able to, to give you a good foundation in uh, addressing the issues. Let me give you some practical issues first just to, to see how um, applicable God's Word is to the things we deal with every single day. Here's the first one. We have to plan to provide. We have to plan to provide. Proverbs 21, 20 says, In the house of the wise there are stores of choice, food, and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. I have heard recently that uh, over 70% of Americans cannot put their hands on $400 cash. I, I don't mean go down to the local title loan place and get their $400. I mean in their savings account or in their checking account or in the jar underneath their bed or where, wherever it might be. They don't have access because there has been no plan to provide for the various needs. This is pretty practical, right? The Scripture is saying to you, yes, God is there to meet your needs, but He's also placed you in, in, in the position in life that you are in and given you enough insight and truth and wisdom to say, I need to prepare for things that will eventually happen. Not might happen, not could happen. Um, stuff just happens, right? The insurance payment is annual. you got to save up for that. Someday you're going to have to go to the doctor. You have to save up and prepare for that. The car breaks down. Uh, I just put a set of tires on my car and cried and grimaced. Um, $900 for a set of tires. I'm going to use tires or something. Of course, I had used tires on the car already, and they had to be replaced. you got to plan and prepare. The washing machine breaks down. You want to go on a vacation in six months. You're going to buy those season tickets. The roof leaks, braces. You, you, you know how this works. This is just the most basic practical thing. And Scripture says the wise man plans. He looks ahead. He sees these things coming. He takes 10 bucks or 100 bucks a week or whatever. He puts that aside. Very basic, very simple. Uh, and then another one, diversify to protect, to protect. Number two, diversify to protect. Ecclesiastes 11, 2 from the New American Standard. Divide your portion to seven or even eight. You do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. Don't keep all your eggs in one basket, right? Guess where that came from? Right here, divide, diversify, spread it out. When you have stored something up, number one, then you have to protect what you have stored up so that it is not kind of wiped out in one fell swoop. We don't leave it all in the same place, right? We don't put it all in the same form of collateral. Maybe you remember the great stock market crash of 1929. Uh, the lasting reflection in my mind is of people who are looking at the ticker tape. They realize they They've lost everything, and they're jumping out the window and ending their lives because it was all in one resource, and that was gone. A few years ago, um, Greece became the current foreboding warning of things to come in the financial world. You remember uh, the country ran out of money, and they ran out of collateral. Nobody would loan them any more money, and then they started talking about it's going to be the collapse of the European Union, and some people rushed in, some governments, to loan them money. Lo and behold, um, governments don't really know how to manage money very well. Um, have you read the news about our country lately? Uh, we already have a trillion dollar deficit, which would have been unheard of just 10 or 20 years ago. And on top of a trillion dollar deficit, we want to spend five more trillion dollars and five trillion dollars is going to cost zero. Did you hear them say that just a few years ago? It's not going to cost anything. And they think we're all stupid. I read scripture. I'm not stupid. I can at least understand. I'm not trusting the government. I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. The people in Greece actually trusted the government to keep all of their pension problem, uh, promises. 
And they were living off of the government, and then the government all of a sudden had no money. Diversify to protect. You've got to have multiple sources, multiple safety nets in your life. Here's the third one, practical issue. Uh, Check your motives. Check your motives. Now, this is spiritual, obviously, but it is also very practical. Proverbs 15, 27, a greedy man brings trouble to his family. You hear that? Greedy is is an internal condition, a, a mindset, an attitude, and yet it is very practical because greed brings trouble. It produces problems. He who hates bribes will live. I'm not going to be tricked or distracted or confused by the money issues. Greed is obviously a spiritual issue with tremendous practical applications. How many families have suffered because of greed? This is why when you see the lotto advertisements, they always tell you to play responsibly. This is like the snake inviting you over and telling you don't get too close, right? The lottery is telling you to play responsibly. The alcohol commercials that ruin people's lives are telling you to drink responsibly. I don't know if there's such a thing as that, right? Such danger. Check your motives. If the yearning is just for more stuff, more money, and you start being risky with it and making um, foolish choices and trying every way you can think of, just more, 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 it's very dangerous. It produces danger and ruins your family. Here's another one. I thought I'd throw this in. Uh, I think it's very practical, and and it's a challenge in a lot of cases for us. Number four, do not co-sign. Yes, the Bible says, and not just in one place. I'll read this in Proverbs 22, 26, and 27, uh, but it's in numerous other places in the Proverbs. Do not be a man who strikes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. They come take your stuff <laughs> or your house or your car. The point of the scripture and the literal translation is do not co-sign for somebody else's loan. It's bad enough to have to do it for your own loan. The risk is obvious, right? When the economy goes south or when you have a, a, a loan where the interest rate grows with whatever's going on in the external economy, uh, you wind up with a much greater cost, a much greater payment, a much greater problem. I listened to Dave Ramsey uh, on occasion. I used to listen to... Um, Larry Burkett, uh, Heroes, uh, he has since passed Christian Financial Concepts was his ministry. I think it's called Crown Financial Ministries now. Uh, and, and they often would tell stories on their radio programs. They'd have guests, family members who tell stories of co-signing loans. And they would always say, I co-signed my son, my nephew, my grandson's loan. And then this happened and this happened. And it took me years to pay off his debt. And so the scripture just says it basically, do not do that. Doesn't mean you don't love that person. Find some other way to help them is the idea. Do not co-sign the loan. So the Bible is eminently practical in trying to help us make wise decisions in our lives. I think this is one of those truths that we need to just remind ourselves again and again and again. You know, church is not some high high on a hill kind of thing, and I go there to to be in this frame of mind and this position that makes me somehow holy and better than everybody else and, and feel like I'm going to heaven. No, church is where we come to engage the Spirit of God and the Word of God so that we can figure out how to live our lives. It is eminently practical. Every question you've got, not just money, Every issue you're dealing with, God's got the answer. And not just to tell you what to do, but to be by your side while you're trying to face it and do it. We can trust the Lord and we can follow what He has to say. And we should know that when we do that, He pours the blessing into our lives. That doesn't mean the giant bucket of money every time. Oftentimes, the blessing is the peace in whatever current condition I'm in anyway or the stamina to face whatever the problem is that I am facing. The Bible is eminently practical. It is also powerfully spiritual when we're talking about money. Money is a spiritual issue. 
It's not just practical. It is a seriously deep, uh, soul-probing kind of issue. Every time you see something you want, and you wish you had the money to buy it or you try to figure out how to get it. That is a spiritual issue. Every time you remember on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night what God says about giving and tithing and you're debating, can I afford to tithe or should I tithe or I really wanted this? That is a spiritual issue. Every time you see a needy person and the Bible tells us to be generous and kind and to care for those who have troubles and problems in their lives. We have to decide from our own hearts, from our spirit, whether we'll respond and what we will do to help that person. Spiritual issues. Let me just give you a brief list, four of these. Um, not in any particular order. Um, just some things that I, I pulled out and felt like the Lord was trying to say to us today. First, uh, as far as money goes, it is a matter of priorities and provision. It's a matter of priorities and provision. You know this verse, we just used it um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Are you listening to me? Seek ye first. What does that mean? Number one priority, right? That's more important than anything else. Right out of the mouth of Jesus, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But then notice what a, a hugely spiritual concept that is. Jesus kind of turns it on its side to give us the practicality connected to it. Seek first the kingdom and then all these things. What things? All these worries. That's Matthew 6. All these things you're troubled about, wondering where your food's coming from, wondering how you're going to get to work, wondering what's going to happen when the bills come next week. The Lord has promised if you will put priority number one as priority number one, he will help you through whatever it is. He will lead you in that way. So it is a matter always of priorities and provision. Number one issue, seek the kingdom Second issue spiritually, it is a matter of desire. It is a matter of desire. That's why it's spiritual. What's going on in your heart and in your mind that's driving you to want this thing or to go after that thing or put all your money here or never have any money? What is the desire of your heart? Ecclesiastes 6, 7 describes it this way. All man's efforts are for his mouth. How about that? Now, this is a pretty bleak description. Uh, the writer's really saying to you, this is typical. This is what's going on with humanity. We're always craving. We want things to make us feel good or take all our problems away or, or uh, just at this basic level, taste good. We're driven by desire. And he says in that verse, his appetite is never satisfied. If you're driven by desire, you'll never match that desire. You'll never achieve this basic kind of thing. In fact, desire easily and often drives you in the wrong direction. Now, the Scriptures do say that we ought to desire the things of God that we ought to desire righteousness and holiness, that we ought to desire uh, revival in our church and in our nation. But the fact of the matter is most people, that's not where the de their desire settles in, right? Their desire is driven by their emotions and their feelings and the last thing they saw on television or the last thing their next-door neighbor had bought over at their house. And that desire just kind of works and works and drives and drives, and it's never satisfied. Guys, who wants to live like that? You know, you're desiring this pretty thing this week. You work hard to get it, and often you waste or um, give away what you have saved up for an important thing and drive yourself into that direction. And then after that's achieved, guess what? Another desire comes along. You remember what John Rockefeller said? One time he was asked, how much is enough? And he said, one dollar more, one dollar more. What happens when you get the one dollar more? One dollar more. And it's a cycle, a rat race where there's never satisfaction. It's a matter of desire. Thirdly, spiritually speaking, it is a matter of mattering. It's a matter of mattering. Here's an amazing issue. People want their lives to matter. They want their lives to matter, but it doesn't matter how much you want to matter if your efforts to matter are driven by matter. 
I, I, I made that up myself. I'm kind of impressed by that. Stuff. You know, it doesn't matter how much you want to matter if the only thing you put into that program is possessions and stuff and junk. Money, power, position. James 1, 10 and 11 says this, The one who is rich should take pride in his low position. That means you're just like everybody else regardless of how much money you've got. Okay, you ain't no better than nobody else just because you live in the biggest house or you have all the stuff that everybody else desires. So start that verse over again. The one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. So get off your high horse, Mr. Rich Man. That's what the Bible is saying here. You're on the same path as everybody else. Money doesn't make you more important. Lack of money doesn't make you less important. This is a matter of your value, your understanding of where you fit in this world and in God's plan. You know if Jesus lives in your heart that God has a special plan for you, right? You know if you've given your heart to Christ, it's come to your mind very clearly that the Lord has put his hand upon you, that he has intended an exact ministry for you, and he is working every day to cause that to happen. So we've got to get our mind off of the world's idea of mattering. Big money, big house, big fancy whatever, aren't I important? We've got to get our idea off of that because that's idiocy. And understand, God says, let my spirit come into your heart and I'll change your life and then you'll be the big man. Then you'll be somebody that's valuable and important. Then your life will have real meaning and real purpose. This is clear and powerful as a spiritual issue what the Lord is trying to produce and do. You better find somewhere else to get your value, somewhere else to establish your purpose and your identity than stuff and money. Here's the fourth one, the last one, a matter of stewardship. It is a matter of stewardship. Very practical, very spiritual, uh, and one I don't think that we understand uh, in the broadest sense. What is stewardship? It's not a word that we toss around a lot in our regular conversations. Let me share with you Leviticus 25, 23. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is, what's that word? Mine. The land is mine. And you are but aliens and tenants. The land is mine. You are but aliens and tenants. Who is the owner of the land? God is. The land that God had entrusted to these people and that he was trying to preserve in families, still, as important as that was, he set that up, still, that land that you own is mine. He owns it. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. What is a steward? It's a manager. It's a manager. And the clear biblical principle is if we're going to talk about money and understand all that God has to say about it, this is where the conversation has to start. Guess what? Everything you own belongs to God. Everything you own belongs to God. Everything you own, from the most insignificant thing you can think of to the greatest and most important thing you have in your possessions, that stuff is God's. Now, if you're a Christian, the way you manage your money is supposed to represent that it's not your money, it's God's money. Think about the implications of this. By the way, if you're lost, God owns all your stuff too. Okay, you're, you're just fighting against the whole plan and refusing to let God bless you with the stuff like he wants to. You're gripping it and holding it as tight as you can. Scripture says that you're the manager, God is the owner. Do you know what that means? Implications of that? That means God can pour it in and God can take it out. 
That means when God gives it to you, there's a purpose behind it. And your challenge, your task is to figure out, why did God give this to me? What am I supposed to do with this? How can I honor the Lord with everything He's given me? He's the owner. I'm the manager. So we've got to really be able to say, the creator of the universe has entrusted me with this portion of His property. How do I manage it? What do I do with it? How do I understand it? How do I apply it? And that verse in 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, it is required that we are found trustworthy. Do you know what it means if you're trustworthy? It means God expands your stewardship. God trusts you with what he's given you. He knows that he can trust you with more. He knows that you're going to use it the right way. He knows that you want to be a blessing in the kingdom. He knows that you're not selfish and grasping it and you're going to spend every penny on whatever your latest desire is. When God sees that you understand it the right way, that you're able to say, God, all that I have is yours. Maybe what we need to say is, God, all that I have is yours. I give it back to you. I give it back to you. How you want to use it, what you want to do with it, it's up to you. You just tell me. Now, let me challenge you guys. If you say that to God, the first thing he's going to do is check you out, right? If you say, God, you can trust me, God's going to find out whether he can trust you or not. He's going to say something like, um, you know, I need you to take that $100 bonus you just got and give it to this person. <laughs> How about that? And your first thought's going to be, whoa, whoa, I, I'm not sure. I, what about $10, God? That's the tithe. I challenge you to understand what Scripture says in how we handle what God has given us. Listen to this last verse, Luke 16, 11. If you have not been trustworthy in handling the worldly wealth, who will be trusting you with more, greater spiritual riches? You see that verse? The way we handle the stuff is even an indicator of how God can bless us spiritually. So it's always a test. It's always that, uh, that window on your heart and your soul. If you want God to work in your life, you're asking the Lord to solve some huge problem you're dealing with. You're trying to see the Lord bless in this area, but you're not being faithful in financial issues. God can't pour it out over there until this is straightened up over here. And this is as basic as it can be biblically. It's a strong truth. Um, we got 2,342 more of these to go, right? I'm not going that far, I promise you. Two more weeks. Two more weeks we're going to talk about stewardship. Pray with me. God, we thank you um, just for how strong your word is, how plain it is to teach us. And we really need to be taught. We pray that you'd uh, give us a, an indicator, a direction uh, for the shortcomings that we have, each one of us. There's been so many cases where we've thought wrong about money and we've had desires that are not honoring to you and we've been wasteful and we have sought the world's plan and the world's glory. We repent of that. Whatever it is, Lord, contrary to your word and your plan, we repent of it. And we pray that you would give us direction, mindset, attitude, clarity so that we can live in this world for the glory of the kingdom of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning. This is a time of response. Our altar is open. If you need to come and seek the Lord uh, in this place, if you need to talk to Him about something you're dealing with and you want to do it in, in a special way of acknowledgement uh, before Him, I invite you to come to the altar. If you need to speak with me this morning, uh, I invite you to do that. If you'd like to know how to give your heart to Jesus so that He can maximize your potential in your life and show you the way to go, come and talk to me about that in that direction.